So this is lecture 13 of ECE 2305. So in today's lecture, what we're going to be looking at is, first of all, we're going to recap Aloha and Slot Aloha. We're going to look at carrier sense multiple access, and we're going to look at CSMA with collision detection. There's another CSMA, and it's called CSMA CA, but we're going to be looking at that in about a week's and a half time. But today's lecture, we're going to look at the multiple access schemes for random access protocols that we started in lecture 12. So let's, let's recap what Aloha and Slaughter Aloha did, okay? Okay. So re pure Aloha. Sounds awesome, doesn't it? Pure Aloha. What it does is if you have user A, B, C, D. What happens is all these users, if they want to use a channel, so call it channel 1. What happens is they can transmit at any time their information. And they hope that they do not collide at the same time with someone else trying to transmit. So in this case, these two guys are in collision and therefore their information is corrupted, right? And thus discarded. And so what happens is in pure Aloha, any one of these users can transmit any time on that single channel, and, and, and what ends up happening is if there's any overlap between any of those two or more transmissions between those two years, users down that same channel, corrupted, we throw it away. Now, slot Aloha, tries to make things a little bit more efficient. What happens is slot Aloha. Aye. Slot Aloha does the following. So what slot Aloha does is the same channel, channel 1, channel 1, and you have user A, B, C, D, what happens is everyone's kind of synchronized. There's a peep, so a PIP, that occurs at the beginning of every time slot. So, boop, 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 boop. And that signals every user say, if you want to transmit something, now's the time. So, oh, OK, user 1 transmits. Oh, user, sorry, user A transmits, then user B. Oh, maybe user A wants to transmit again. Oh, but user C wants to transmit at that exact same time. Conflict, and therefore that data is in collision, and therefore is corrupted, just like before. But as opposed to before, where there was no rhyme or reason, when things transmit, here we at least keep everyone to some sort of uh, beat, some sort of pattern. They fall in some sort of silo. And what ends up happening is, at the very least, we don't have sort of packets just coming in anywhere. Everything is sort of aligned according to specific timing intervals. But notice how everyone just jumps in, right? It's almost like someone goes up to a lake, and they see, oh, look, here's this big cliff. And the water is so dark down below, I'm going to jump into it head first, right? Not very good, right? Normally, what you would do is you would go down to the water edge, and you would say, oh, just two feet under is this big stone, right? And uh, you know, so with aloha in general, and slot aloha, so pure aloha, I just like that name. It's pure aloha. And slot aloha, there's this kind of like, like leap first type of thing and don't ask questions. On the other hand, wouldn't it make more sense if someone wanting to use the channel looks before they leap so they don't waste time or they don't collide and have to retransmit and expend energy? And that's exactly what CSMA does. So what CSMA, or Carrier Sense Multiple Access, does is the look before you leap. What happens is it's like, is the channel clear? Should I transmit? If it is clear, you transmit. If it's not clear, you stand by and wait for your turn. 
All right? And collisions can still occur because what happens is the phase where you scan to see if the channel's available and the phase when you transmit has a little bit of latency. There's a little bit of delay, right? I want to transmit. Is the channel clear? Okay, the channel's clear. You may transmit. In that amount of delay, that amount of time, someone might have already jumped in and transmitted. And that's how you can get collisions. So as a result, what you have is in that period of time. So you have collisions. They're detected in a time interval. And, if, and the way you would do it is you would actually hold back until the channel's clear. And then you would transmit. And it's often used in things like wireless or wire, wired networks. Wireless is a little tricky because what happens is sometimes you may not hear if the channel's available or not. So where is this case heard? So this is a little bit of an aside. So let's look at a wireless environment, mainly because I'm biased. So let's take this again. So let's say we have a CSMA network. So let's say we have user A, B, C, D. And this is an example of what I mean. Okay? So let's say user A, it scans. It wants to transmit. Let's say it wants to transmit here. Is the channel clear? Is anyone else transmitting on channel 1? The answer is negatory. So it starts transmitting. B wants to transmit. Oh, 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 oh. And so let's say here, but channel A is trans uh, uh, user A is transmitting. So it waits, and then it looks again. Oh, OK all clear, and starts transmitting. Now, here's the problem. Suppose this is some sort of wireless local area network, or WLAN. Ah! And say this is my access point, right? Like that guy there. Suppose A, B, C are here, right? Let's say D is over here, and D is transmitting to A, I mean to the access point. What do we know about this? It's very weak, right? A, B, and C might, might not hear D's transmission, but the access point does, right? And so what ends up happening is, let's say A, B, or C, like let's say D is now transmitting over here. And I'm going to put down here, very weak. What ends up happening is there is a possibility that someone's going to transmit not hearing that D is actually transmitting at the same time. What we call this, there's a name for this. It's called hidden node problem. This happens all the time, right? Like with my hearing and everything. And everyone's like wondering, why does Professor Uglinski, like, you know, yell at the top of his lungs or talk loud? And the reason is, um, I'm not sure, maybe it's my hearing. Like, you know, growing up in Montreal and turning the stereo or the headphones on to maximum and everything um, when I was young and stuff. And so my hearing's kind of bad. If you ever see me at the gym running, it's like you can probably know I'm approaching you from behind if you're on the track because you can hear me in the music coming from behind. But what happens is it doesn't help when, let's say, far away my wife is saying something, and then I say something to her and just completely overwhelm her and stuff. That's a hit and no problem. So here, what you've got, this is very serious, though, because this will result in a collision. Um, C's information actually probably won't make it because the access point will hear C, and it will hear a very weak version of D, and the two are going to interfere and be corrupted, and no one's going to know that uh, this corruption is happening in progress, right? Until the, base, the access point communicates back and say, hey, I didn't quite get that. There was corruption. So as a result, there is an issue with respect to hidden node. Now, so in wired local area networks, perfectly fine. But wireless, not so much so because of the hidden node problem. So the way this works, the carrier sends multiple access. So you have a network interface car, or NIC, right? And it receives a datagram from the wireless network. It creates a frame around. Yes, Thomas. Uh, for channel B, looking at channel A transmission. Yeah. Um, will it eventually like learn, OK, channel A is good enough? 
A little bit. So what, what will happen is that's a great, great question. So would channel A learn from channel B? Conventional equipment, no. Um, but again, like I mentioned last week about that cognitive radio thing, absolutely. So what happens is if you can see what the behavior of other wireless users are, how frequently they access the wireless channel, how often they transmit, what bandwidth they're transmitting at, fantastic. You can then find out, like, you know, for instance, that question about, like, on the quiz, in regards to which channel would you choose, channel one or channel two. Now, suppose you expand it across a very large swath of frequency and you see everyone's behavior and you find openings or channels that are not as frequently used. That's where you would use a cognitive radio. So exactly. In a conventional radio, it's kind of stupid. No, not stupid, but it's like, it's unintelligent. What it does is it just does everything from a probabilistic standpoint. What it does is essentially, it, it, like, you know, like let's say it tries to transmit, oh, I'm going to back off, and then some random time, try and go back on. Oh, it's still busy. I'm going to change now the statistics of how much of that random back off I'm going to, the, so it influences the statistics, all right? In fact, that's what this uh, slide the, uh, at the bottom says. That's a great lead-in. What happens is if your NIC detects a collision, it aborts, and what this exponential back-off is, hmm, I'm not sure if I should bring it up because this is math. <laughs> what this exponential back-off, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it anyway, and then you guys can send me angry emails saying you said there would be no... So how many people here have taken probability of any sorts? Probability... Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, just bear with me. You're, this won't be on the quiz, okay? I promise you. Okay. Prof. Wiglinski promises. I'm just going to put up here so I won't get into trouble. Or, in case I forget, you can bring this up in, uh, you know. Screenshot. Yeah, screenshot. Say, Professor, you promise. Professor Wiglinski's promise. Not on quiz. Okay. So just bring this up. OK. What happens is what is an exponential random variable? What it happens is it has a PDF, or probability density function. This describes the randomness of the random variable. It's so exponential. What does it look like? Something like that, right? What this tells me, this exponential random variable, OK? So this is the probability of this random variable assuming a value between 0 all the way to plus infinity. So let's say I have a value x here. This guy here is the probability that x equals little x occurs. So let's say the, that's a 1, but we don't get that. So let's say over here, that's 0.3. What this value, let's say, what is the probability that my black box my exponential random variable x produces little x at the output is probability 0.3. has a 30% chance of being produced, right? So what does exponential back off mean? Exponential back off means this black box x, it's like, let's say, OK, there's a collision. What do I do? How long should I wait? Black box x, tell me what I, how long should I wait? Boom and then gives you a value, right? And the value is more likely, it's going to assume a va value here than a value over there. So let's say the value to the left, all those values are like, let's say, 10 seconds, 5 seconds, 1 second. And then let's say further to the right, like the guys over here is like 50 seconds, a few minutes, and such, right? So doesn't mean that your back off is impossible in terms of getting 20 hours, but the probability of that happening is super minimal. But the probability of getting something like one second back off or maybe 10 second back off is pretty high. It's not, not positive. It's not one, but it's very likely, more likely than 10 hours. Okay? So again, remember Wolinsky's promise. This won't be on the quiz, okay? So you don't have to study. But it's FYI, okay? OK? We're cool? All right. Woo! So what happens is, 
So whenever anybody says with CSMA, there's an exponential back off, that's what it means. It means that for small time durations to back off, they're more probable than, let's say, very long time delays to retransmitting. And what happens is it's influenced by the collisions that it experiences. Let's say I want to transmit again. Oh, I'm being collided again. Maybe I should really back off a long time. And the parameter k, so k, what happens is it chooses k at a random value between 0 and uh, uh, m, uh, sorry, 2 to the m minus 1. And then there's like this funny value. So k is chosen at random. And then it waits by that amount of uh, a bits, uh, bits time. And then you ret return back to step 2. I think I must have made a typo in the slides. Nevertheless, so what happens is the way this works is you constantly try and visit that channel, see if it's available. And if it's not, then you return to the back off mode. And your back off time, the amount of time, gets influenced by how many times you hit a collision. And if you constantly hit, maybe you need to back off more and more and more in case of that scenario. All right. And CSMA CD is way more efficient than Aloha or Slot Aloha because I'm not sort of jumping in. Oh, I collided. Let me retransmit. Rather, it's before I transmit, let me see if anything's going on, and then I'll transmit. So what happens is we have the maximum propagation delay between two nodes in a, wire, in a LAN, the time to transmit the max frame size, because the thing is you need to make sure that when you're transmitting, you want to transmit your information, probably has a maximum size, and you want to make sure that no one else is colliding into you during that time. So we have an efficiency equation here. 1 over 1 plus 5 times uh, the t uh, propagation delay times the transmission time. All right, And this efficiency goes to 1 when you let the propagation delay go to 0. So if you have no propagation delay, right? It's just like, boom, you're transmitting. There's no delay in terms of sending that information out from node 1 to node 2. And, you're, and what happens is if you have the max frame size go to infinity, what happens is if you hold, it, hold on to it, you actually, your channel uh, be becomes actually a little bit more productive. Because what happens when you have uh, infinity? Anyone? What happens when your denominator is infinity? It goes to zero, right? So what, what does that mean? Your efficiency, you only accommodate one guy, and what about all the other guys on the channel? Right? So as a result, this has better performance than Aloha does. And then we also have something called token ring, where what, what you've got is you've got a master node, and you've got a bunch of slave nodes. And what this master node does is, it coordinates all the slave nodes in your network to sort of coordinate the, the net, uh, like, you know, things like how they connect and share information with each other. So it's a way of transmitting in turn. So the master node says, OK, slave node, now it's your time. So it's a little bit more of a centralized approach. But the problem is you have a single point of failure, which is the master. You have overhead, this guy saying, OK, now it's your turn, your turn, your turn, your turn. On the other hand, token ring, OK? What it does is someone always assumes the master. So, OK, you want to transmit? Here, you're the master. And then you decide who's going to be the next guy and the next guy. So you kind of decentralize the architecture. Um, but you also have overhead, you have latency, and you still have a single point of failure in terms of that guy who assumes the token position. So what we saw in today's lecture, so what's the punchline? So let's say. Um, you know, other than Professor Wilinski teaching a little bit of probability, I'm sorry, you know, I, I taught uh, grad level probability, ECE 502 for five years. Um, a few years ago was like my last class, so I really miss it. Um, but let's say, forget about probability, which I shouldn't have brought up. What's today's punchline? CSMA CA. What's so important about it? It's an efficient way for dif different devices to access a wireless channel or a wired channel and not waste time colliding, 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 but rather it's look before you leap, right? It's like, oh, is anyone there? Oh, yes, I'm going to back off a little bit. The exponential back off is a probabilistic technique where it dictates how long you wait, and that is random. Okay. 
So with that, uh, that concludes lecture, what is it? Lecture 13.